So thanks for, uh, very much for the invitation and I'm looking forward to that meeting that sort of covers half of biology united by the use of uh, sequence information. So in this regard, I, I, from Gene, I switched topic and I'm going into environmental sequencing and compare two ecosystems, that's the human gut and the ocean with a focus on our struggle, how we get biomarkers, being it species, being it genes, being it pathways, uh, that can capture uh, complex environmental properties uh, like age or uh, uh, like I will show you one slide on, on primary production even, so biomass production. But we, before going into this, let me introduce a little the subject. Um, environmental sequencing, lots of people in the audience uh, uh, know what it's about. Uh, you see all these exponential growth curves. I can add one here, although it's dated already. Uh, uh, in terms of the only difference here is it's not a number of base pairs, it's a number of um, uh, novel open reading frames that come up here. And I think environmental sequencing is really uh, uh, shooting through the walls. We have by now, I think, more than 200 distinct million, 200 million distinct genes somewhere in a database. It's an enormous amount of data, so it's lots of value for, for your money. Uh, compared to resequencing, for example, which is nevertheless also important, of course. And it covers all kinds of different ecosystems. So as a bioinformatician, we always, if you want to compare two data sets, uh, there's always a problem, you know, that you have always apples and oranges. Um, and just, this is just to remind you of this, uh, despite being methods becoming much better, standards arising, etc., etc. So in so environment sequencing, you start with a sampling, you go through all kinds of uh, bioinformatics procedure. At the end, you want to arrive at some kind of phylogenetic composition and also function composition and use the two to say something about your ecosystem. That's the goal. It's still true. But you have a moving target here because all kinds of uh, particular sequencing uh, technologies, the chemistry is changing. And, and what the lines are, are these interdependencies. So if some there are the read length changes, the assembly changes. So if you compare two methods, you have to be very careful uh, what you're really comparing. So to use, you know, it's a nightmare actually for a bioinformatician, but uh, to see it more positive, that means if you compare two dif different data sets, you don't see a com combined signal. You can always blame some methodological flaws, uh, not necessarily uh, your own uh, kind of uh, hypothesis. But if you do see a signal, this is highly uh, uh, significant. So this is our working assumption to get over the frustration to find with all kinds of uh, technological, technological issues. And as, um, yeah, as we are here at near GG, uh, JGI, so, so our first sort of uh, reward was a collaboration with Eddie actually long time ago, comparing four very diverse communities. And what we figured pretty quickly uh, that the, you know, kind of the gene content of an sample is like a fingerprint for the environment. Obviously, this was just uh, ocean water, soils, so a very diverse environment, so it was you know, low-hanging fruits, but at least it was a conceptual uh, kind of uh, uh, starter uh, to get more into this. By now, of course, you have to go much more into the details. Uh, you have lots of samples in very similar environment, and scratching signals out here is much harder. So there was a lots of method developments on the way. Our workhorse at the moment is called Smash. This is a tool. It's not a web server. You can download it. You can basically pipe your own data through. Therefore, it's kind of a mini advertisement here. It works for us. It's not the most simplest tool, but it has lots of functionality. We have two flavors. One is for single cell analysis and one is for metagenomics. Also, what come, came a lot with this new kind of data, lots of kind of visualization tools had to be developed. So here show a few uh, um, particular, I mean, of course, you have, you know, use Google Earth here. Uh, uh, um, uh, in the human body, in any kind of ecosystem, you have to uh, zoom in. You have to be able to, to address spatial and temporal resolution, which is just emerging. Uh, I would draw attention on two tools we have. It's called iPass. Uh, here we can basically map your data on metabolic pathways and just visualize where differences are. But also ITOL is a kind of a species tree. You can map your species information even via genes or so on, onto the tree and you have a, some kind of ideas what is in your sample. So those kind of things that took a lot, lo uh, long time. As I'm talking today about biomarkers, so the, the, the challenge actually is uh, connecting your very diverse uh, uh, genomic information on the genes and the pathways or the translated products uh, with environmental parameters. Environmental parameters, again, can be as diverse as temperature, uh, if you talk about the ocean, other things, or uh, uh, nutrition factors, if you talk about uh, humans. So, uh, so it was lots of tool development having a kind of a many-to-many -many correlations. So again, I have to tell you all this because before I can come to the results here. Uh, today, so I zoom in using this repertoire of, of tools in a way to, to compare two different systems. 
on the ocean uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the human gut particular, and the ocean motivator is that we are sort of involved, and so I never was on a boat, but as a boat touring around since 2009, collecting data, I come back to this, and uh, we had to prepare for the data that will come or are about to come or are coming already or so. So lots of investment there as well. Interestingly, on the ocean, the, the development started much earlier. In print, I think one could take uh, Greg Wenzel's Sargasso Sea samples here. On the human gut, it started later, but of course there are lots of applic medical applications. There was lots of funding investment here, and things have evolved, in my opinion, a little faster on a gut, which is probably also a much simpler ecosystem uh, uh, than on a... Uh, um, on the ocean, Tara started at the end of 2009 here. This is just one out of many attempts where at least in the ocean also people lumped together to consortia as a European initiative of all the marine biology stations at least to coordinate uh, their efforts. But of course, it has to be taken uh, to worldwide uh, uh, activity in a, in a gut. There was this International Human Microbiome Consortium that helped a lot to, to sort of unify a few of these things. Okay, so I mentioned this is about biomarkers. So what you can do using the tools is this is now data from, from the GOS, another of Greg Venter's public data, uh, only a bit more than 30 sites, so very little, very little sampling things. The depth is not very really great. You can criticize the data, but as I said before, if you see something positive, it's usually good news. Uh, so this is about 30 sample points. What can make then, if you assign your genes uh, from a metagenomic sample, you can collect them and you can, this is this case, plot them onto metabolic pathways, but also other things. And you can see then that, uh, uh, for example, as expected, oxygen is correlating uh, uh, um, with, with photosynthesis. But you see also quite a few other kind of pathways that consistently uh, increase as a, as a gradient of an environment pa a parameter like temperature increase. It can be a one-one correlation, so temperature with one gene. It can be a many-to-many -many correlation, several pathways uh, with several environmental parameters. Therefore, we had this uh, uh, CCA analysis. Then you do it a bit more uh, globally, you can do this. In a way, what you see here, it's basically where uh, uh, you take all kinds of parameters collected against all your genes and pathways, and you, you just ask an unbiased question, uh, so what kind of parameters seem to be more important? And this is kind of a PCA analysis. So along those axes, you see the climate factors, and here you see the nutrition factors. Uh, so that means that if you trust the data, it, it, it means that the climate factors seem to be more dramatic, impacting actually what the composition of your community is. Obviously, there are lots of caveats to this. Uh, uh, this is um, seasonally corrected, but of course, you have uh, day-night rhythm. You have all kinds of things that are not in there. There are many more signals. It's just uh, the, the tip of an iceberg. We start to see uh, uh, some uh, uh, signals. To our price, uh, we could also see rather complex environmental properties. I mentioned already uh, one of them, uh, primary production. So, and that is more than just gene content, uh, because uh, like in ecology, you can also uh, describe your gene repertoire uh, with terms like diversity or richness. And uh, uh, what you see, for example, there's function richness of these serial samples, uh, so they differ according to the latitude, which is well known as an effect. So it's reassuring that you see signals that are sort of uh, uh, known. But also what we see that functional diversity uh, uh, correlates, you see how it, this is not that strong, but it does correlate uh, with, with primal production. Obviously you, obviously, you don't need these things because those things are measured uh, from a satellite. And, you know, it's, it's expensive to shoot one satellite up, but if it's up there, you know, it can record many, many data. But this is just a uh, proof of principle uh, that even complex property you can capture with a rather limited set uh, uh, of uh, molecules. Um, just to show where we are, so we had big plans, obviously, for this Tara expedition because it started early, uh, October 2009, so it's one and a half years on a road. What you see here is the road, is about 90 sample points, almost 100 by now, uh, that have been collected. So what's different? I mean, there are many boats uh, uh, that go around. In terms of genomic data that we collect there, uh, it's uh, basically several different filter sites with ambition to go from a virus fraction to even animals, uh, meaning fish larvae or, or very small uh, uh, other animals, and also eukaryotes, I mean lower eukaryotes, protists, etc. And also because you have them on one shot, try to correlate them, basically building species networks, you know, which virus with which fish larvae, etc., etc. Over many, many samples, not over 30 or so, but we collect about 300 here, we hope to see correlations by the co-occurrence of particular uh, uh, things in different size fractions. So also it's not on genomics, it's also transcriptomic data. We have also some special ideas how to deal with the, with the process and other eukaryotes with, with large genomes because it's also a cost issue, obviously, here. 
And uh, obviously, we collect a, a laundry list of oceanographic data, physical chemical data, location, temperature, salinity, et cetera, et cetera. So about 20 of those. But what's new about it is also the correlation with uh, data on morphology. And, uh, uh, there's uh, quite a few microscopes on board for imaging. And uh, this actually what takes currently most of the time to correlate genomic information with, with things you see in a picture. So there are lots of pictures and movies on, on fantastically looking organisms, but who do you know, you know which kind of uh, uh, genes come from which of the many? So it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, uh, kind of challenge right now uh, we are struggling with. So uh, although I said the sampling has been done for 100 stations, only for three stations, three stations the data are uh, in a, uh, complete in a way that the bioinformatician can take over. So there's the sequencing, assembly, whatever, that take always time. Uh, uh, so that's the first start that we consider as three stations out of, the, out of the many. But again, the data are frozen or conserved in other ways, and um, this is what we are up to. But it's nothing t for tomorrow. It will take uh, uh, a little longer. And data integration uh, of, of very different data is a challenge. So again, instead of getting biological answers, we're still struggling with the tools here. Uh, Let's switch to the uh, an analogous system, the, the human gut. I mentioned already uh, um, so there's lots of funding uh, out, uh, uh, particularly in the US, uh, for this. Uh, there was a kickoff meeting for an international consortium uh, trying to at least define the standards that we can exchange data. Still much more you have to do on this front, uh, uh, but at least there's a kind of an exchange of information on, on, on different parts here, uh, regular chain. So what kind of questions can you ask? I mean, the first thing is, I mean, it's known that everybody of us carries about, you know, one half to two and a half kilograms of bacteria in our gut. So, so how does it translate into uh, uh, diversity, species, etc.? And how many genes do we have compared to our 21,000 or so uh, human genes? So it was uh, done last year in collaboration of a European consortium called Metahead and also uh, Beijing, BGI here. Uh, not Beijing, BGI uh, in, in Shenzhen. And the first study was based on 600 gigabases from 124 people, actually uh, uh, Danish and Spanish uh, individuals. And uh, uh, just to see using the analysis pipelines, one can get out of these things. To make a long answer short, <coughs> what we found is about 3.3 million microbial genes we expect there, whereby it's very fishy what they call a microbial genes. You have to have kind of a operational definition. Very simplistically, this was applied 95% identity. Uh, um, you, know, you can argue about this, but uh, uh, so based on other kind of estimates, I think in Chile they, they proposed that 95% for species is a good thing. I claim it's very superficial, but it's, you know, given the complexity, it's a very good starter. So the things might change, but I'm not sure that dramatically. And the reason why we think you can argue if we would sequence 200 people, you would get twice as many genes, et cetera, et cetera. You see these kind of refraction curves where basically uh, on the known genes that are well annotated, on genes that you know at least, but they're hypothetical, and then genes that just come out of the assembly uh, that haven't been seen by databases. Uh, so the, the, this is a number of individuals. There's a kind of simulation here. Uh, if you would have only half of the data, et cetera, et cetera, uh, if it builds up. The known genes here are so pretty much saturating already. And uh, with um, uh, unknown genes, it's going up, but it's not doubling uh, uh, if you add a few more people. Uh, on the other end, you have to add 6 billion more, so it's quite a bit of more, more people on Earth um, in different states, ages, etc., etc. But the novel genes are the fast evolving. So intuitively, it makes sense, but the message here is just, although the, the numbers will go up, it won't go up too much. And even if it does go up, uh, then you have to ask the question, you know, is this only your intrinsic genes you have? Or is this a bystander that comes with their food? If you have fish, eaten fish yesterday, you got the salmonella with it, etc. but it's not intrinsically. So, so uh, we made some estimates here as well. I'll come to this uh, uh, in a moment. Next question to ask is really, uh, you know, how different are our guts? Uh, and is it stratified? You know, everybody would ha suspect to have different bacteria, um, uh, in particular as we eat different things each day. Uh, but uh, uh, is this sort of, are there signals in, or is there everybody very different? So this is a study on very few data, and it was a problem at that time, uh, and we struck a long time with this. There's only 40 samples from different groups, from six different countries and three continents. And uh, um, a question here is, I mean, of course, what you can do, of course, you can sort of assign the data, and there's one of these typical rank abundant curves uh, at the genus level, because we cannot be more sensitive overall. This is Bacteridis, uh, which in the average has 10% of the most prominent uh, genus in our gut. 
This is a kind of genes you have, histine kinase, uh, 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 as a signaling molecule, which seems to be the most prominent uh, protein here, but there's a complete different kind of axis here or, or labeling. And then this is the low, long list of probably one half thousand different uh, uh, things that come along here and grouped by color and different phyla, et cetera, et cetera. So we have very little human contamination. Contamination is good. We, we don't see many other eukaryotes in these stool samples, neither archaea and viruses. We are a little more uncertain, uh, but certainly it's not dominating uh, uh, the scene. So what you can do now, you just let the, uh, uh, you know, you just cluster the thing and see whether all the parameters were recorded. So host property like age, gender, nationality, or ethnicity, uh, uh, um, body mass index. We had a couple of uh, metadata, so host properties, and whether anything of those is driving age, for example, it's known that infants are very different, um, but an and elderly are supposed to be different in, in their gut microbiota, but we had a whole range of things here. And can we see what's, uh, you know, what's driving uh, or where are these parameters are? Again, back to the bystanders. We also had to make sure, so when we, we, we did the tax habitat tax uh, taxonomy of, of the species, so we sort of said this is a known species with a habitat gut. This usually only comes in soil. And this is only associated with some cow, etc. So those habitats we tried to separate in the ones we would expect in a gut and where we have seen something which is not expected there. And as expected, the, the, the gut ones, they saturate quicker in terms of number of individuals again here than the non-gut ones. Uh, uh, um, but it's not sufficient data to quantify how much is really intrinsic and, and how much uh, uh, is, is uh, coming daily in and, and going out daily in, in a way. So if you do cluster, uh, they had a big surprise in a way. Uh, in these uh, 40 or less than 40 samples, we found three distinct clusters pointing and stratification. But of course, in statistics, with 40 samples or less than 40 samples, you can cluster anything somehow. And uh, so we had to really prove that this is an artifact of the, of the undersampling in a way. So what we did also, we had, this is Sanger data, so we had good kind of quality data. We went back to our uh, uh, kin and all, the Illumina data I showed before on the 124 uh, European individuals. We have also seen three clusters. They are not as nicely separated, but after all, this is Illumina. Um, there are lots of issues here. And also we went back to Jeff Gordon's uh, study with about 250 people, just 16S data. And also, uh, uh, if you cluster three distinct clusters, are preferred choice if you ask you how many clusters you want, etc. So we take this now that it will survive a while in terms of that, they are, that the human guts are stratified. And uh, we could associate now the drivers for each of these clusters, Bacteridis here, Privotella, uh, and then a bit more mixed cluster. But interestingly, uh, the more data points you have, you can, and I mentioned this before, via co-occurrence or avoidance, you can start building species networks here, so which always together, uh, toge together in a sample or absent in a sample or avoiding each other in a sample. And this is shown here, so we have three, uh, distinct networks of species uh, which seem to be doing something with each other that can be very indirect things. It doesn't need that they directly interact and eat the metabolites of each other, but uh, at least it's starting point. And now, of course, we have many, many more data. These kind of signals are expected to be uh, 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 much stronger. So I mentioned um, or made an analogy with blood groups here in a way because uh, the strange thing is we couldn't find any correlation with host properties that we observed with these three clusters. So we have no clue uh, what's driving these three clusters. We can say what genes are different, what pathways are different, there's a difference in vitamin biosynthesis between the clusters, but we just don't know really what's causing. I also have a hypothesis, but what we don't know. By now we have almost 400 data in a, in a, uh, sampled in a similar kind of way, 400 individuals, humans. Uh, Europeans, and what's emerging is kind of a, a, a kind of a landscape. So it's not like blood groups that are clearly defined. It's per se density of preferred community areas. You have the three here, and uh, it needs to be seen if you have 10,000 individuals, whether the clusters fall apart. There will be more of that, but the stratification uh, seen by these density plots here uh, uh, seem to stand even with uh, uh, larger cohorts. So that's kind of a reassuring thing. And uh, it calls actually for, for striving, trying to understand why. Is this immune system? Is this uh, our, uh, how we get rid of our hydrogen, etc.? Lots of hypotheses possible here. Uh, uh, why these uh, uh, three kind of clusters? So I mentioned we have no correlation of the clusters with host properties uh, that we started, but for each host property that we an analyzed, we found significant biomarkers in terms of uh, genes and pathways. Less so with species, that could be still our limited data set. Uh, uh, but much stronger with pathways. Showing, showing a couple of views here. For example, if you combine five orthologous groups of five gene models, basically, 
um, and look against age here in this thing, you, you have a very nice correlation, much stronger this if you take known or enzymes you could think of that might uh, uh, correlate uh, uh, with age. And the same is with body mass index here. There's a very strong correlation uh, in the stool sample uh, to an extent that I think I can predict plus minus three years how old you are from your stool sample. On the other hand, it's not really needed because you know how old you are. So again, this is just pilot uh, uh, projects here. And, uh, 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 but it shows that a complex property can be reflected uh, by those marker genes. Again, we need many, we need many more samples to see how solid it is if you go really into testing motors. But of course now it's a big hunt going on for uh, diseases of all sorts, obesity, um, worse kinds of bowel disease and cancer, just uh, a few of those. Just to scale off a little bit here, is what we also do in the same consortium, uh, uh, working on uh, several diseases and uh, there's sometimes in very intensive um, uh, 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 consents, uh, almost 800 questions that poor patients have to be answered before that stool sample is taken. It might even have an impact on, on a stool sample if you think uh, about it. Uh, it's pretty stressful to go through and uh, the people are asked really you know, how much pizza do you, did you eat last week, etc. and what is your preferred food and all kinds of things. And there are tools that translate that kind of pizza of whatever, uh, 12 inch or something, into uh, uh, um, uh, a, a combined set of nutrients, about 150. Uh, so people did this before in nutrition uh, sciences uh, that you have to normalize the pizza with the fish you have eaten, etc. So and then you have now these 150 or so parameters uh, um, of nutrition and want to correlate it with about 150 metagenomes. This is our cohort set for that particular question. And uh, again, this is what I'm telling you where we're struggling right now is uh, just to make uh, this a bit more comprehensible. There's a lot of redundancy in the, in the data itself, in the, in the, in the metadata, in these nutrient data. Uh, uh, and things like abundancy of food, uh, people not always say the right thing. Um, there are all kinds of issues uh, uh, that we have to deal with this. But I, I have some hope, uh, but I can't show you results yet, um, that we come to at least some relevant uh, correlation out of this jungle of environmental uh, uh, properties in a way. Um, how am I doing with time here? Still a couple, couple of minutes, I guess. So just uh, more from a tool perspective, um, what I was saying, the, the, med the, the sample sizes have to increase, but also this temporal and spatial resolution increase. Take again the example of a gut. So we take stool samples and claim that it's representative of what's going on in us, which is obviously a, a very wild proxy. Uh, we don't know. We do know that they're different uh, in different intestinal parts. And if you think about the surface of a, of a gut, uh, probably more than two tennis courts with all the cavities, et cetera, et cetera, there might be lots of distinctions in there. And, and to show you that it's probably the case, just taking an example, again, it's a collaboration with JGI and Norman Pace here, a long time ago uh, on, a, on a Mexican salt lake where they took basically 10 layers, uh, two millimeters apart roughly, and, and the question was how different are communities in these distinct layers? Uh, so basically we, we zoom into two centimeters. I introduced IPASS already, uh, the tool they can project data on. So what you see here, this is a metabolism, which is still the old IPASS version. We have version two now, which is much more ex uh, extensive. And uh, by color intensity, you can say a certain enzyme is more abundant. So if you zoom through this kind of thing, so all these layers, uh, these are the, uh, the 10 layers we have from the surface downwards in, into two centimeters here. And what you see flipping here, different intensities, meaning more of a certain pathway uh, uh, or an enzyme might push this kind of signal up. So what you see in the upper part is photosynthesis, as you would expect, because there is light. And uh, reassuring, if you go down, this thing disappears here, so there's no enzymes, uh, you know, two centimeters in, in the ground already. But you see lots of other things that correlate. I think this is lipid biosynthesis. I think this is, a, uh, is an undersampling issue that it flips so much. These things always exist. But if you see correlations, you know, the lower part here and the upper part there, it tells you there might be even enzymes that are not captured by our current knowledge so far. So there's lots of stuff to do, not only sampling increase-wise, but also uh, going into a temporal and spatial issue. I think Rob Knight might touch about it in a, in a human microbiome a little later today. Uh, so there's a huge need to, to, to get into there, uh, that we don't see wrong signals with our uh, limited data. Just for summing up, uh, the three things I wanted to bring across today, uh, so what we manage now is really that we, we get towards biomarkers with the hope of diagnostic, even prognostic potential in some areas. But again, we just start with known things. We have to go into the unknown much earlier. But the tools seem to be good enough to these things. And uh, um, 
but also the correlating to parameter changes, which is also um, uh, is an important thing in terms of uh, 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 or interpreting the, the community as such. We are not yet at the nucleotide level. There's more to see, strain differences, et cetera, et cetera. This is beyond our resolution at the moment, given the data we have. Uh, but it's very encouraging, at least for us, uh, that, that we can go towards these biomarker uh, uh, developments. So I mentioned in the human population was a kind of a, a finding uh, that was surprising to us that you have a stratification that might be also in other habitats, uh, that it's not just a, a smear of different communities, but uh, uh, densities of certain community populations which are favorable to each other. Um, and uh, 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 function phylogen composition mostly agree on the samples we have looked at, but only we looked at ocean and we looked at uh, uh, gut. So we can always argue there might be a virus carrying an important function that spreads in a community so that these, uh, there are skews coming, and I'm sure it exists, but we're not seeing it too much. Some of it we see, actually. I don't go into this. And uh, uh, can I reiterate that the current study is just the tip of the iceberg. We have to go much more detailed in this to make more uh, uh, realistic statements about uh, community behavior. But I also believe the species, species networks that are emerging uh, they give a, a, a lot of ideas also how things can happen. And I was always talking about uh, bacteria versus bacteria. Uh, but of course, bacteria versus host or other things uh, uh, is also an issue here. So with, things, with this, I would like to thank the people who did the job in a group here. This is basically our, our current team, except Jeroen, who, who left to, uh, to Brussels. Um, for all the metagenomic data analysis. And we have also our two provisors, Ivica and Takuchi. Without them, we would struggle even longer. Uh, so we are more biologically oriented, but we need uh, uh, lots of tools here and, and uh, the connection to uh, big centers for compute as well. Uh, I mentioned Eddie already. There are a couple of others, mostly in consortia, where we collaborate. BSC is a supercomputer center in Barcelona where we collaborate because our local resources uh, are not always adequate, although we have good resources, actually. And if you want to know more about these things, I can refer you to the website, what we are doing science-wise. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Diurnal and circadian rhythms play important roles in living systems. I wonder whether the time of day of sampling affects your um, metagena. Yes. So this is what I said. If we, if we don't see a signal, uh, uh, it doesn't say anything. But if we do see a signal, uh, this is true. So what we are seeing stands, although you are perfectly right. You know, bugs swim up in the ocean uh, in the morning. If the, uh, you know, the sun gets too strong, they have to go down. There are tons of known regula uh, regulatory mechanisms for this. And we don't capture any of this without any temporal uh, uh, measures. But what we capture, uh, uh, for example, one explanation is that the climate factors are stronger than the uh, nutrition factors. Uh, the nutrition factors might be stronger in the day-night rhythm. Uh, this is a prediction we have. Uh, but again, the tail of, day of yes, it's important. But I think it's more important what you have eaten yesterday and, and many of these things. What we see, uh, uh, you know, or two days ago, it, it takes usually two days. Uh, for a passage. Uh, this has a huge impact. Time of the day, there is rhythm, we know. Uh, we have no data. I think there will be much more we carved out. But again, it doesn't say that what we have is wrong. So we see a strong signal, and then if you zoom in into spatial and temporal resolution, you see other signals and learn much more. And, and this is what I am claiming. You need to do more in order to capture these things, because they are relevant. And so your kind of iPath gene pathway analysis is sort of central to all of your analyses. In a way. Mm -hmm. Would it be at any help to have whole genomes versus you know, the numbers of genes? Good point. If you assume that uh, the genes have a fixed kind of number, from a genomic transcription is a different thing now, but from a genomic perspective, so if you see five genes of one genome, you would assume all the others that are in, so it will be very value additional information. You can say you know, what, how sensitive you are, what you lose, what you don't see how the biases are. From that perspective, for sure. I don't see, yeah. I think there's a, there's a big mess. So it's a question of matter. If you have a deep enough sample, even some of it depends on environment, obviously. In soil, it's a different issue. But if you have, uh, in the gut, we expect in the order, I think we have more, but people expect 500 to 1,500. If you have deep enough sample, those genomes might somehow even fall out 
at some stage if you, if you sequence deep enough. So it uh, depends, of course, how, how low abundant they are. So. But uh, uh, the advantage here in any case is the mapping. So whatever we do, how to recognize a gene in a sample, uh, the easiest way is you take the raw thing, if the read length is sufficient, you know, we are at 100 right now or whatever, uh, uh, if you take Illumina, if you can map it against something which is clearly annotated, and here the power comes in. So I wouldn't say it's not important, uh, m maybe not for the interpretation, but from a, from a methodological aspect, you are much safer. And I think it's an advantage, the human gut, uh, they sequence all these reference genomes, uh, it's a huge advantage in terms of uh, um, seeing how many reads you can map to something known already. I'm not sure anything, but yes, uh, the, yes, the strong part comes in the early bits, I would say. Can you say something about the uh, genetic determination of, of enterotypes from the from host? Uh, we don't have data yet. I mean, it's of course a thing uh, uh, I think many people look forward. Uh, uh, they take basically biopsies and watch both, you know, the human side and the microbial side. It's an ongoing hunt, particularly in the medical area. Uh, we don't have any data on this so far. Um, my bet would be uh, uh, it's more the nutrition, but also uh, I think the immune response plays a big role. It's pretty unknown, uh, you know, how the good guys are tolerated and the, the, the bad guys not. So it might be some imprinting here, which goes again, uh, uh, might go back to, to uh, uh, genetic factors. No clue, but it's a very interesting one. Have, have you been able to replicate the relatively small number of enterotypes in, in a second or third? Population. Yes, so we, but I tried to say in one, I don't want to this anymore, in one thing. So we, we have seen it in a very small sample of uh, uh, 35 or so, and we could reproduce it in a sample of uh, 100 and a sample of 250. 250 Americans, different 16S, very different technology. 100 Illumina, very different technology because we had still Sanger Center data. So, and that was Europeans. Uh, so, within American population, if they also three distinct things uh, and they uh, uh, agree with each other, uh, it will survive for quite some time. I mean, we haven't had any kind of uh, exotic lifestyles or exotic geographic locations. Um, there might be more, there might be different things, but uh, um, we don't say that we have these three types forever. These are preferred community uh, uh, states, and there might be variations or division be needed uh, later on to be seen. Other questions? If not, we'll take uh, about a 20-minute break, try and be back here uh, uh, right after 10 o'clock.